we've got a long way to go. And Ideopolis fixes major problem for some independent contractors, but it's a large structural problem that's affecting, you know, a couple hundred million Americans. Welcome to Unemployable, the podcast for independent workers, freelancers, Dow contributors, and other self-employed folks who want to own their employment and become self-sovereign. We may work alone, but we can be unemployable together. This episode of Unemployable is brought to you by Opolis, providing health insurance, benefits, and payroll for the self-employed. Join the community at opolis.co. That's O-P-O-L-I-S dot C-O. In this episode, I'll be speaking with Spencer Graham about how to find work in Web3 and what it's like to work for DAOs full-time. By the end of this episode, you'll know how to make the transition to Web3 full-time, how to earn this magic internet money working with friends, how to replace your traditional income, and what it's like working in DAOs. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Unemployable University. I'm your host, Joshua Lapidus, and today we're talking to Spencer Graham about Web3 life, how it all got started, what his transition was like, where he's at now. How you doing, Spencer? I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm honored to be the first guest on, on Unemployable. This should be fun. Excited to get into it. I couldn't, I couldn't think of anybody else who was more unemployable than you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll talk about how that is no longer an insult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There are a great many ways that I think I could introduce you, but I think it'd be best if, uh, if you, if you told our unemployable crowd here who, who you are. Yeah, it'd be fun to hear all the different ways that you would introduce me, but I, I could definitely start myself. I think of you as this like rock star product manager who, when, when we first met, actually, I was, I was very intimidated by your demeanor and was <laughs> like. Well, okay. So I'm, I'm Spencer. I actually go by sometimes Spengra, which is like a portmanteau of my first and last name. <laughs> um, I have not decided to do the whole pseudonymous thing or a non thing. I, I think that's kind of interesting, but I just have never felt comfortable not presenting myself as myself, but, but who I am is, well, that's, that's a complicated question, but I started out, I guess my, my journey towards being unemployable. I mean, we could go back to like college and, and stuff, studying economics and psychology, which like sort of led me here in a long winding path. But I, I never really actually thought that I would want to be working for myself. I remember thinking like maybe before college or in college or like when I was thinking about finding a like a full time job that like, no, it kind of makes it kind of nice to have somebody else taking care of the stuff. By the stuff. What do you, what do you mean by the yeah, stuff? The stuff like all the admi administrative things, I guess you could include benefits in, into that, but also like, what is it I'm going to be working on? What like? helping direct, basically being directed rather than directing myself. And like, just like a lot less, there's a lot less, at least I thought there was a lot less stress involved in, in that kind of job. But my evolution away from that perspective towards the perspective that I've, that I hold now, I think mirrors my evolution or like discovery of, of crypto and web three, where like the introduction of a new technology or something that makes something newly possible changed my perspective of, of like changed how I see my values and I, how I want to live my life. And I think lots of people talk about, talk about this, like once they discover crypto, once they discover DAOs, they like feel like they can't go back because it just opens up this huge possibility space that, that closing off would feel very painful. And I feel that way about both the technology of, of crypto and blockchain and, and smart contracts. And I also feel that way about my, I guess I should not just say work, I should say my life now within within that space so like i i for a long time i was working for companies being directed by a boss like where to spend my time i do recall like feeling like having some autonomy within that was really something i desired but i never i for a long time i didn't make the connection between that feeling and like the broader sense of actually having autonomy until much later. Does this inform your yeah. discussions of like when we talk about DAOs and the definition of the A when you uh, think of autonomy, autonomous? Yeah, I think in, in, a, in DAOs, the A does not mean autonomous as in driverless car. It means autonomy as in more like sovereignty. But the autonomy of the organization is closely tied intimately tied with the autonomy of the individuals in the organization. I don't actually think they can exist without the other. So it sort of serves both purposes. So backtracking a little bit, because we're in some very high level concepts that we haven't 
yeah. defined. <laughs> All right. So you, you come from a corporate background and I know you to yeah. be a product manager. So do you, do you want like a, what, how did you get into product management and do you feel comfortable talking about where you used to work and how that works? Yeah. Yeah. I, I got into product management because I was feeling in my previous, one of the like previous career or previous job that the sort of research slash consulting that I was doing was not rewarding enough. Like the work was interesting, but it sort of stopped when I like gave my recommendation to my clients and then they would go off and do something interesting with that. Or at least I thought they would or hope they would. And I, I start, I remember feeling like, man, I wish I could just do that. So I started searching around for jobs that involved that. And I ended up landing on product management, which which was very exciting to me, given my interest, long interest in in technology, and I started getting into into it that way. I worked, ended up working at uh, Optum, big giant healthcare corporation. Definitely not a shining example of individual <laughs> autonomy. <laughs> Felt very, it was like very stodgy, extremely bureaucratic. I think they've gone through a number of evolutions since I left that it potentially had some positive impacts there. But I, I don't think there were a lot of, the, the speed of innovation was very slow. It, it, it felt like a fundamental trade-off, like having the power to do a lot of really great, important things because you have this large organization behind you or with you or, or at your disposal in some way. Having that made it difficult to do things quickly. So one of the things I was excited about finding this other option was breaking that trade-off or solving that trade-off or that dilemma. But yeah, I was working as a as a product manager. One of the things that is required of a product manager is being able to speak lots of different languages, not you know English versus uh, Italian or whatever, but um, using the the language, the the vernacular of different groups of people who are working on different things. Uh, business people speak a different lang language than developers who speak a different language sometimes than designers who speak a different language than users, customers, etc. So it's like internal, like a translator. Yeah, like being able to to kind of exist in different circles and translate and and connect uh, across those and understand different perspectives. That is something that I have kind of over my career, if you could call it that, I think developed some some skill and some enjoyment in in doing. That's not unique to Web two. There are product managers in Web three. So, what was your first experience working in? Like, what was the first DAO you showed up and was like, "Hi, I'm Spencer." Uh, that was Raid Guild. I kind of, I didn't actively, I wasn't actively at the time looking for a DAO to join. I was actively looking for a way to do more within the Web3 space. At the time I was still working at Optum, I had been personally enthralled with Ethereum and smart contracts and, and that kind of thing for a few years, it's just on the side as a hobbyist, uh, mostly consuming content and learning and building up a knowledge base. But less so building stuff, getting involved and, and doing things. And I kind of got, I was sort of put in touch with some people who were at Raid Guild and had heard about Raid Guild. And when I saw that as an opportunity of, of something to, to, to join, I was very exciting because I could really start to, to build things. But what ended up happening is I, like beyond just building things, I learned a whole about a whole new way of engaging with doing stuff, engaging with work, engaging with with complete strangers on the internet. And that was a huge, huge inflection point for me. So it's, it's, it's fair to say that you did not get married to the first DAO that you met. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I, I was in a pretty serious and steady relationship with Raid Guild for a while. I, I'm still a member. I spend less time there than, than at first, but I owe a lot of, kind of a lot of random things. What, what hat did you wear? Haha, <laughs> good question. I wore the monk hat for the most part, monk? which is monk okay. and designer and a little bit of a uh, solidity developer. Do all DAOs have these kind of unapproachable names for what web two job? Like, so there, every web two job has a web three counterpart, right? And for the most is part, it easy? Yeah. Was it easy for you to navigate that? And like, you showed up and were like, what what is the product manager? And they're like, oh well, you could be like a archer and like maybe a mage smith. And you're like, okay, what is this? Like, what what was the what was the process like for you? Honestly, it was pretty pretty seamless. I kind of put together that combo myself. I was I asked a couple of people if there's a product manager role, and I was like, no, not really, but maybe we should have one. But the 
the names of monks and archers and and paladins and like it was it was just fun i it was pretty easy to understand <laughs> you start working in web3 what was your like aha moment where you where you realized i could do this i can i can work in this space full time um we're doing this thing we're calling it like a product dao and i didn't really understand what that meant at first <laughs> but i got got a better understanding of, of what that was as i as i got involved and i was like oh man okay i have this background in product management this is a we're like build, going to be building a product as a DAO. We're going to be practicing this whole new way of of creating something. Let's explore what what that's like. And also, the thing that we're creating is exactly like the the tool or infrastructure that helped or that facilitated me having a really incredible experience within Raid Guild. That's a this is a great opportunity. And the fact that like there's going to be funding behind this and people are going to be able to work in like a consistent it's consistent basis. That's really exciting. So, and then like the more I got involved and felt like it was really a good, good fit and that I could contribute in a meaningful way at a certain point, I was like, okay, that's it. I'm quitting. <laughs> I'm quitting my job and I'm just going to, I'm just going to do this. It might be a little bit of a risk right now, but I feel confident enough in my ability, maybe via raid guild to like add um, by by joining additional raids with additional clients and bringing in some other income that way, or just by continuing to build on the skills that I have now that I can find, like cobble together a reasonable income. And then as it turned out, I could definitely do that and more. So that was really exciting. Two questions that are off of the same point that kind of go in slightly different directions. Uh, the first one would be when you were considering your transition from Web 2 to Web 3, what were the primary things that you were worried about and then, you know, let's just start there. Yeah. Um, the consistency of income. So like both consistency and quantity or like a, or level of income. Like in order to make a decision to quit my, my day job, I wanted to make sure that I could, it, it would be difficult to like walk away from that salary if I couldn't get reasonably close to that or have an expectation of doing so over, over some reasonable time frame. How long did it take you to get back to Good question. what your Web2 salary was, uh, if you have yet? No, I have. Yes. Maybe. Win for the good guys. Six to six to eight to six to eight-ish months. But I can tell you a story later about maybe 12 months afterwards when I, well, we'll save that for later. So the other thing is like consistency. Like, could I get the, the work consistently? But then the, the other big one was uh, healthcare. Like I had. So I was kind of poking around on on the exchanges. I had previously, like at a other time in my career when I was kind of between jobs or like pri sort of like other, it was, it was like independent insurance or something. And it was just like very, very bare bones, which worked for then, but but less so as yeah. I get older. <laughs> um, so that was a big question. Uh, so it was finding Opolis was actually a really big catalyst in me being able to make that decision with confidence. I, mean, I was working in healthcare on the like financial sort of revenue side of things. And like, it was, it's just, it's just a hot mess. It's so broken. Like all of the incentives are completely backwards. And actually that was like realizing that. And then also learning about like web three and, and smart contract and smart contracts and stuff at the same yeah. time was one of the things that got me most excited about that new, new those new technologies, because I could, even back then could clearly see how even if the technology wasn't ready, like they were like the first thing in a very long time that actually gave some kind of real structural change or create the promise for real structural change that could reorient the, all of the backwards incentives into more like correct ones. We've got a long way to go. And Ideopolis fixes a so major long. problem for is some independent contractors, but it's a large structural problem that's affecting, you know, a couple hundred million Americans and however many people outside the U.S. One of the biggest structural problems with healthcare is that it's tied to employment. And there's a many reasons why that's a, like there's many sort of problems within that where that creates yeah. a lot of problems. But one of them is just that, especially now that people are not really at the same job for 30 to 40 years, like maybe they used to be 30 to 40 years ago. Every time you change employers, likely your your healthcare is changing, which means that yeah. the the insurance companies and like and it, and then when you if you have to change doctors and and providers as well, 
like nobody has an actual real incentive to make you healthy over the long term. Right. So it just like that's one of the factors that contributes to like we have sick care where we pay for right. when we're sick, not for preventing us from getting from getting sick or getting hurt or being unhealthy and not not for staying healthy, which is what we should be doing. And if we if we manage to create a system where I I have the same health care for 30 years and my insurance company, if, even if that's not the government, the insurance company knows that and expects that, then they have a direct incentive to put in investment and help me stay healthy so that their costs are lower over time. And that's a huge structural change if we can make it. When you started working full time, you said it took between six and eight months to get back to par on salary in those first months what did the like pay volatility look like was there ever a time when you were like shit i'm not gonna be able to pay rent or carry a balance on a credit card or something what was it like one of the things that helped me to make the decision to get into web3 and now work full-time is like was and am in a lucky enough position where i like if i don't have a a paycheck for a month or or more that's okay um i can i can live with you that. Have some savings that you could bank on yeah yeah and not not everybody has that and i think that's important to to recognize for me though that was was and continues to be valuable to allow me to take some some risks even if i'm like definitely not one of the the bigger risk takers around in this so, in so for folks that do have a little bit of um that would be a riskier jump it's not as not as stable uh, where would you say that they should, what would you put up as like a, a resource for maybe um, either getting a grant or finding an easy like starter community? Uh, I mean, in, in general, like zooming out a little bit, even from there, you know, service DAOs are, are a great starting place. The reason they're great is because, well, I guess there's, there's a few reasons. One is that typically you're getting paid for services you provide. So those services don't necessarily have to be like Web3 or crypto or DAO specific services. Um, Raid Guild is a service DAO and it happens to provide like Web3 free, uh, Web3 developer builder services. But there's a lot, there are other service DAOs that do like public relations. Yap DAO is, is, is one of them. Um, or, or other things that have a stronger tie to, or somebody with more web web two skills could probably pretty easily slide into. There has to be some drawbacks. What would be, I don't know, a handful of, of things that you, maybe you miss about the old world or just would like DAOs to improve? Well, it, it's hard. Like you got to navigate like all of this mur somewhat murky uncertainty or like in a, well, in a well-run traditional company, everybody has specific things that they're focused on, things they're responsible for. They know who's doing what and who has what skills and who they can go to. In a DAO, building up that context can take a long time because there's no, like, there's no directory usually. Uh, I think starting to to get better at that, but there's no boss to tell you what to do. There's no like. Often there's no like, here's exactly what our objectives are and where you could fit into that. You often have to find that out for yourself. And this is getting better. Uh, people are building better tools for, for this kind of thing. And DAOs are, are developing better practices for how to, to not fall into that kind of trap. But it's still hard. It, it takes a certain kind of mentality and desire to find that stuff and, and, and find your place. And it also takes... It can be difficult to, if you don't start with a, a degree of confidence in your skills, it can diff it be, can be difficult to build that up, uh, because or I can I can imagine that it would be because the the relationships the the shape of the social picture is is can be difficult to to navigate and understand. DAOs are starting to do better jobs of like giving people buddies and partners to like help them in and like introduce them to people, bring them into the social structure of the DAO. But yeah. it's still not it's still not ideal. Uh, we're gonna get we're gonna get much better at this over time, but right now it's a little bit challenging. So so far we've talked mostly about technical things and very technical people trying to navigate social situations that are a little bit more lateral. Are there there's two two sides of this question. 
are there non-technical roles that are compensated and or compensated well in DAOs and then follow that up with maybe what is what is in the highest demand right now? That's a good question. Uh, the answer to the first question is absolutely. There's a huge emphasis so there's hope on... For <laughs> there, <laughs> there's hope for you, Josh. Um, okay, excellent. There, there is a huge emphasis on like social glue type roles, people who can yeah. bring other people together, connect people, create opportunity. So like an internally focused community manager, like a. In, I think it, it is both internal uh, within the community and also external. And relationship building with with other communities is is really valuable. There can be technical components to that in terms of like dev rel kind of advocacy yeah. advocacy advocacy type stuff but there's also just like community ambassador delegate person who forges relationships across communities and finds ways for those communities to work together or just vibe together or whatever it is so let's say i'm i'm in a web2 job that requires me to work with my hands but i want to i want to get involved in the future of work and the new economy like what? Well, let me ask you: What is a Web two job that is that involves your hands? I don't even know. Like, are you talking about like gig work kind construction of construction work? Not even gig work. Just like, like you, okay. like the a lot of what DAOs are. Everything that we've just described and talk about is between you know Notion, Discourse, Discord, Zoom. You know, right. like all of it. All of it is to a degree interpersonal skills. At least for non technical, all of it involves communications and okay so the, the, i think there's a really good reason for that that that, that it is the way things are right now and that's because the technologies that we have that facilitate these new sort of structures and organizations are based in software and they connect mm. best to software which is what is like those that's the tool of knowledge workers i think there's nothing or there there are ways that we can start to connect these constructs to like the real world slash meat space and like doing doing things with your hands but we're it's going to take some time to build out the tools to make that actually work in the way that it needs to work one of the things i'm working on now is the ability to like delegate to somebody else in a revocable way and that might allow Ooh, how do you do that we'll get, we'll get to that um that might allow like a a, a dao to bring in people who are doing things out in the real world and still maintain, not have to trust that person completely. They have the ability to like revoke some of their privileges or revoke their the whatever authorities they need to be able to do that in the real world. So none of this stuff exists quite quite yet in the way that it needs to, but we'll get there. It'll just take time. There's good, like we're sort of slowly building out bigger and bigger circles where the stuff, the the technologies, the infrastructure, the foundations, the practices that we work with now. Slowly building out the circles of circles that they're touching, and we'll we'll get to the we'll get to everything soon enough, or at some point. What would you say? Uh, and maybe not an exact number, but like a range, because I want to I want to give people an idea of of what you can earn working for either an early mid stage DAO that's like it's it's got funding, it's it's a uh, it's able to to pay competitive. What is a what does a product manager make? Is it monthly or hourly or yearly? How does that stuff work? Well, all of that is in in flux as DAOs like, figure out their models, and I think the the recent bear market has introduced introduced a lot of new ones and forced DAOs to reconsider a lot of their models. DAO House, for example, has gone from offering uh, contributors the the choice to have like more of a consistent monthly effectively a salary every like for with a sort of couple two or so month commitment on both sides has gone from that to um, like more project based work where you kind of have to say here's what I'm going to do over the next month or two and yeah here's what that needs to here's what I need to be paid to do that like, I, I think eventually we're going to get to it like one of the strengths of DAOs is that there's more flexibility there and it, you don't have to like a DAO unlike a company doesn't have to like stick to one just like one type or something so i do think there's going to be a point at which DAOs can kind of handle a a variety or create a lot of present a lot of options to contributors but like a lot of that there's there's not like standards yet for for a lot of that stuff setting the last three months aside what is a typical product manager at, at DAO house and do you think of it as 
what do you make hourly, weekly, monthly? How how do you think about it? I don't. Yeah, I think about it more as monthly with a like a back of my mind conversion to annually. I think because okay. still my because it changes my, month to month. It can it, but it can. mostly mostly when it changes month to month, it's because I have decided to change my own month to month. So like. One one month, I might I might be deciding to devote like X percent of my attention to a particular thing like Dow House, and then another month I might decide to drop that down a little bit because there's something else I'm working on that's important too. Um, so my Dow House income would would drop uh, proportionally in in that case. To answer your your specific question more concretely, it it's still just like a regular company. It still depends on like how experienced and talented and, and valuable your your skills are um, so i think there's like probably ranges of like sixty thousand dollars a year in an annual kind of sense up to like maybe 150 or, or more depending on how certain incentives work and who are you it's a DAO, so who are you negotiating with who determines what level of yeah. product manager you are and do you self-report hours how does that work so th all of that also very much in in progress, still figuring out the mechanisms for that. But ultimately, my hope is that you are basically negotiating with the DAO as a whole, or the the DAO as a whole, or the 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 people that you work with most, and that have the best understanding of the value that you are either capable of creating or are creating, are the ones who who determine your compensation. And my my expectation is that it's going to look less like periodic negotiation. And more like you kind of start at a certain point, and then there's somewhat consistent and fluid signals that change your compensation and incentives over time based on how valuable uh, you are, how much value you're you're creating, and also the budget of of the DAO. So like multiple because... converging signals, kind of creating this fluid measurement of of how valuable your your output is or your work is has dow house struggled to uh attract and or maintain talent because of this fluctuation or no i don't think so um dow house has done a pretty good job of like very very organically attracting some really talented people where we i think could do better is more actively trying to attract people with specific types of skills that we don't have great coverage on. We don't really do a lot of active uh, like recruiting at this point. So like, we end up getting, we tend to like bring in people who sort of work with people that are already in Dow House. And so there's like a, uh, we like, get stronger at our strengths, but we have yet to figure out the exact process for strengthening where we are not very strong yet. Still figuring that one out. Got it. How very diplomatic. Um, <laughs> as we wrap this up, uh, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Do you prefer Twitter DMs, Telegram, Discord? I mean, I'll probably back up my my expression of, of Twitter as a great resource and, and say Twitter. I think that's that's a pretty good way. Oh, you want Twitter DMs or like public on the main tag you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe we'd like end up going to, to Telegram or something later, but Twitter's the probably the best place to start. Just at you. Okay. At Spengra. Just at him. Just, um, just and then where can we find out more about Dow House and Hats Protocol? Probably the, the best place to find about, out about Hats Protocol right now is also Twitter, at Hats Protocol. Uh, we probably will have some more places to go find out more at some point, but that's the place, best place to start right now. Okay. And then Dow House, now Dow It on Twitter, uh, DowHouse.club on the old internet. And uh, <laughs> there's links there to our Discord server uh, for if you have any questions or interested in either starting a DAO or, or helping out and, and contributing. Thank you so much for joining us, Spencer. It was very informative. The unemployables have learned a lot, and, and I'm sure we'll be following in your footsteps. Awesome. Thanks so much for, for having me on and jamming on all this stuff with me. Always good to talk to you, Josh. Love it. See you soon, Spencer. Thank you for joining me today as we got a little deeper into working in the ecosystem. The future of work is Web3 and we all need to be ready for it. At Unemployable, we'll be looking ahead to see what's on the horizon and bringing you top strategies for thriving in the new economy with freedom, 
flexibility, and peace of mind. I hope you got a lot out of this first episode and the conversation with Spencer. Be sure to subscribe to get notified when our next episode comes out. By the end of the season, you'll be able to call yourself a DAO expert, if there is such a thing. I'm your host, Joshua Lapidus, an executive steward at Opolis, co-founder of Spork DAO, professional diplomat, and tenured professor here at Unemployable University. Till next time.